During our fellowship, our attendings used to talk about the days before meconium aspirators were invented and when they really wanted to try to clear out the trachea from meconium or other secretions or whatever, they would literally suck on the endotracheal tube or a little bit of tubing to try to get that gunk out. And you can imagine there's a lot of stuff in babies' mouths and lungs, not just the meconium, which hopefully is sterile, but we used to ask them, did you ever get anything in your mouth? And they just used to kind of shrug and be like, sometimes, really heroes. Luckily, meconium aspirators were invented a long time ago. Have you ever seen one of these? Do you know how they work? And do you know when we use them? Hi, I'm Dr. Tala and I've been a neonatologist for 17 years now and interestingly we used to use meconium aspirators all the time. Then as the recommendations and NRP changed we really hardly ever use them now and so I think a lot of people literally don't know how and when to use them. So that's what we're going to cover today. One, what is a meconium aspirator? Two, when do we use a meconium aspirator? And three, how do we use a meconium aspirator? If you're just interested in that, then just skip along to the end of the video. They are a very useful tool to have because sometimes a meconium aspirator is literally the difference between being able to oxygenate and ventilate a baby. So hopefully by the end of this video, you're going to feel completely comfortable using one too. Before I go on, if you would like a say in which videos we publish next, as well as PDF worksheets and neonatal tips of the week and Zoom sessions, then please think about joining our channel membership. The details are all below. One, what is a meconium aspirator? Well, a meconium aspirator is also called a neonatal tracheal aspiration device. And it was originally invented, like we said, to be able to suction out meconium through from the trachea for infants that were born through meconium-stained amniotic fluid. As we'll talk about in a little bit, the practice of when we use this changed in 2015. So now we use these a lot more rarely, which is why, honestly, a lot of people don't even know how it works. The aspirator itself is a little piece of plastic transparent tubing. And basically, one end of the aspirator attaches to your suction system. So this is attached to the suction and the other end of it attaches to your endotracheal tube like that. So basically what it is actually doing is making your entire endotracheal tube a tube for suctioning. We'll go over exactly how to use it in part three when I do a demonstration on our actual mannequin. Two, when do we use a meconium aspirator? Well, interestingly, before 2015, which is like 10 years ago now, which is crazy, the NRP, the National Resuscitation Program guidelines, was that any baby that was born through meconium stained amniotic fluid, if they were non-vigorous, so they were like floppy, then the recommendation was to immediately intubate all of those babies and suction out the meconium as you are pulling that endotracheal tube out. That was honestly one of the reasons why we used to talk about how so many more babies used to get intubated, that and the preemies, to be fair. But then in 2015, the guidelines changed so that even if a baby was born floppy and needed resuscitation, even if they were born through meconium stained amniotic fluid, then basically NRP still recommended to start going down the usual NRP guidelines. The rationale was that suctioning a little bit of meconium from the trachea is unlikely to make a huge difference in the evolution of the meconium aspiration syndrome for the babies. Really, it was thought that a lot of the meconium was already in the alveoli, which obviously you're not going to reach by suctioning out the trachea, so a lot of that diet damage was done. Also, by definition, it's traumatic intubating a baby every single time and then suctioning out. And you're using the ET tube as a suction. So if the baby really does need intubation, you have to do it again. Sometimes there's loads of secretion. So you end up intubating these babies several times trying to suction out all the meconium. So it's all associated with quite a lot of trauma. So the conclusion of the NRP steering committee was to avoid any traumatic procedure when there really wasn't good enough evidence for a benefit. So routine intubation and suctioning are no longer required. 
Now, if a baby is born through meconium stain amniotic fluid, if the baby is breathing and term and has good tone, then that baby can still stay with its mother. If the baby doesn't have any one of those things, then you bring the baby over to the radiant warmer and you start going through the usual steps that you would go through an NRP as if the baby was born through non-meconium stained amniotic fluid. If the baby is not doing well, then using the meconium aspirator would happen a lot further down the entire algorithm. So basically, when do we actually use the meconium aspirator according to the NRP now? So three things need to be occurring. One, the baby is born through meconium stained amniotic fluid. Two, the baby is not vigorous or has very poor tone and very poor breathing. And three, the positive pressure ventilation that you're giving is not effective possibly because there is meconium blocking the trachea. My friend and brilliant colleague, Dr. RP, wrote a review article on this, suggesting that maybe the pendulum has swung too far the other way, and maybe we should be a little bit more aggressive with trying to get that meconium out. It will be interesting to see what the steering committee decides in the ninth edition of NRP coming out in October. I think right now the way most of us are interpreting this is to have a pretty low threshold to use the meconium aspirator if we think the baby really needs it. So we're not necessarily going to go all the way through Mr. Sopa if we really think that there's like loads of meconium pouring out of the trachea. I do just want to remind everybody at this point that per NRP, if there is meconium stained amniotic fluid, then there should be two people at the delivery who are just there to take care of the baby, including one who is able to intubate. Okay, so that's one time that we would actually use the meconium aspirator, when the baby literally has meconium aspiration and we think that the airway obstru is obstructed. But, and this is why you really need to be aware of this little tool, you can also use the meconium aspirator anytime you think there's anything sticky or there are any secretions which may be blocking the airway. If a baby has a lot of sticky mucus, and this can happen a lot if there is no or very little amniotic fluid, for example, in a P-prom, or if the baby's kidneys aren't working or whatever. So if the mucus is really sticky, sometimes that really does block the airway. So meconium aspirators can be helpful trying to get out that like sticky mucus there. Or if the baby is born with a really bad infection and there's like globules of pus in the trachea that are preventing adequate oxygenation and ventilation, again you can use the meconium aspirator to try to suction out some of that pus. A colleague of mine used this recently and after he suctioned out the pus, actually sent that to get it cultured and figure out exactly what bacteria it was. It was very helpful. There are case reports of meconium aspirators being used in other scenarios. For example, in this article, it was a 33-year-old woman who had choked on chicken pieces and they literally used the meconium aspirator to suction out pieces of chicken without having to do anything a lot more invasive. So yes, just think about this tool. Right, let's go on to part three, how to actually use the meconium aspirator. Well, the first thing you need to know is exactly where the meconium aspirator is and to actually think about using it. You would be surprised how often that is the biggest roadblock. So discuss it with the team before you go to the delivery. For example, a baby born through meconium stained fluid or P-prom or a baby with chorioamnionitis. Meconium aspirators are single use and disposable. So they all come in these single use packets and thankfully they're pretty easy to open. So we'll get that out like that. Let's go through the steps. One, the first thing you need to do is make sure you actually have suction tubing available. And let's just assume that this is appropriate suction tubing. So remember, you should have that available at all deliveries. So set the suction pressure to a safe level, typically between 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Remember, we really want to avoid damaging the delicate airway. The whole thing is a pretty traumatic process, intubating and then purposely pulling out the tube. So anything you can do to make this as gentle as possible is ideal. Number two, connect the meconium aspirator to the suction source. Again, this isn't exactly the suction tubing, but this is the end of the meconium aspirator that you should be attaching it to, like the kind of Christmas tree end. And it attaches really easily to the regular suction tubing. So you can see right here that we've attached the meconium aspirator to the suction tubing. Number three, Intubate the baby with an appropriately sized 
endotracheal tube. And it really doesn't matter which endotracheal tube you're using because the plastic little ring at the end of the endotracheal tube will fit all the meconium aspirators. Number four, attach the end of the meconium aspirator to the endotracheal tube. So now you can see that one end of the meconium aspirator is attached to the suctioning and the other is attached to the endotracheal tube. Okay, this isn't suctioning yet because we have this gaping hole here. So what you have to do is put your thumb or cover that hole so that it actually works as a continuous suction. Before you even start withdrawing the tube, then suction a couple of times intermittently, just while the endotracheal tube is in place, hoping that maybe you'll get something out, like below the level of the endotracheal tube that's in the trachea. After you've done this a couple of times, I would probably just kind of let go of the suction port just so that to help ventilate and oxygenate the baby. Obviously, while you're continuously suctioning, the baby is not being oxygenated or ventilated. Then, and this is the critical part, while you're applying suction so that hole is covered, slowly pull out the endotracheal tube over a few seconds. You can do it intermittently if you feel like the baby's getting in trouble, but basically holding that pressure continuously really helps suction out all that stuff in the trachea. It would be great if that suctioned out some big glob and now the baby is breathing easily and the heart rate is above 100, but if not, you may need to re-intubate. Obviously, you're wanting to use a different endotracheal tube when you re-intubate. So whether you need to suction again or whether you just need the tube for actual ventilation. Obviously, like I said, if you re-intubate, you want a new clean tube. And in really bad meconium, sometimes we're going through like three or four tubes. Well, I hope you all feel good about using an aspirator now. If you got this far, then please like the video and think about subscribing to our channel if you want lots of free neonatal education. Thanks so much for being here.